Jesus, we are free. Hallelujah. 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 Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 There is coming a day, GCC, where you're all going to dance. I know it. I know it. Not because you have to, but because that's what the Spirit of the Lord is going to do. Hallelujah. So, Father, help us to jump into that, enter into it. Be even more undignified, Lord. I'm not caring who's around us. We love you so much, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, love you, love you, love you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus.
tasted and seen love I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Let us become more aware 
Hallelujah. I love you. I'm thankful for your presence. I'm thankful that I don't have to wait till I come to church to experience your presence. Father, I bless you. I bless you. Father, tonight, there is no burden that we need to carry. But we can cast it all over onto You. 
Like the old hymn, Father, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, Father, may we know your presence, not just here, but wherever people are watching. May it be strong, may it be powerful, and may your will be done, Father. We are hungry for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I don't see any ugly people here tonight, so why don't you go ahead and greet all these beautiful folks? Hallelujah. Well, I'm hoping that all the people who aren't here tonight, you know, didn't choose to stay home for any particular, you know, athletic endeavor. You know, they talk about Nielsen ratings and, you know, the TV programs that do better than other programs and so forth. And I can guarantee you, guarantee you, that our streaming tonight gets a higher rating than the Super Bowl in heaven. Guarantee you. In fact, I doubt if anybody in heaven is watching the Super Bowl. But there might be a few people watching our service. I don't know. But I do know this, as far as God is concerned, we have a higher rating than the Super Bowl. (laughs) Glory! Touchdown! (laughs) Okay, praise God. This coming Friday night will be the youth praise team practice. It starts at 7 o'clock and it's for the youth that are age 13 and up. 
So that's this coming Friday night, 7 o'clock. All you youths, youths, all you youths, be here. Praise the Lord. And uh, you'll have a good time. All righty. This morning began a message that has to do with our emotions. I'm going to review just briefly and then finish this up. But I read to you a list of emotions, and I'm going to read those again. Failure, oppression, discouraged, or discouragement, depression, offended, stressed, giving up, worry, fear, hopeless, confusion, defeated, rejected, anxiety, unloved. Those are all emotions. And those emotions, as I mentioned this morning, there was somebody in the room battling at least one of those. There's at least one person in this room battling those. You say, well, is that revelation by the Holy Spirit? No, it's common sense. (laughs) Really. Because it's hard to get I don't know, two, three, five, ten people, whatever, together or more, and not have at least one person battling at least one of those. And one of the things that we covered, or a few of the things, uh, number one, what have you found in Scripture which supports you holding on to any of those feelings? Because you, you have to hold on to them. This is not something... Satan can't lay this stuff on you just because he wants to. You have to make a decision to hold on to these kinds of feelings. And number two, over which of these feelings, these emotions, has God not given you the victory? Over which? Well, none of them. I mean, He's given you the victory over every single one of these. No exception. No exception. And number three, none of these emotions, none of these, is a part of the nature of a born-again spirit. None. Absolutely none. Knowing that, then there's no way that we can defend living with those emotions. And yet Christians make all kinds of excuses. All kinds of excuses. You don't know what it's like to live in my circumstances. You know, you haven't walked a mile in my shoes. Well, you haven't walked a mile in mine. Well, yeah, but you know, your life must be pretty good because I never see you going through those emotions. (laughs) (laughs) Could it be that I've made the better choice? You know, there's a poem, I think it might have been by Robert Frost, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood. One was more traveled than the other. Well, you know what? I've chosen to take the road less traveled. And that's where... I mean, used to I'm walking the the road that's worn out. (laughs) Ruts and everything else in there. But I've chosen to make a U-turn, you know, and get on this, this road less traveled and not hold on to these things. Not not the way I used to. I mean, listen, I'm still going through a lot of this as, as well. But... I've sure learned a lot over the years. And number four, holding on to any of these is actually fighting against the life of God in you. If you're holding on to any of these emotions, you are actually battling God's character inside you. And number five, what reason can you give to justify retaining these emotions? And a lot of Christians, they'll talk about, well, you know, my kids, my husband, my job, my money. My health, my this, my just go on and on and on. Okay, well those are circumstances, but circumstances and problems cannot force these emotions on you. No matter what you've gone through. And I, I, I tread lightly on this subject, but when you suffer the loss of a family member, it could be a spouse, parent, child, when you suffer the loss of a family member as a Christian now, At that moment, you have a choice. And you can live in grief or you can live in freedom. It's totally up to you. 
And I can tell you right now, the two people, the three people, the three people who have gone through the worst when it comes to losing a family member, the first two, Adam and Eve. They're the first parents to ever lose a child and the first parents to ever face death of any kind. Adam and Eve. You try justifying your grief with them. They had one son murder another son. They had never seen a dead body before. Never. And yet, they had to go through that. But most of all, God had to go through the loss of His only begotten Son. So, we as Christians cannot justify parking in grief's lot. We, we can't. We can't. And some people would say, well, you know, you just don't have any compassion. No, I do have compassion. I know this. God has made it possible for us to live free from these emotions. The difference is what we do with what God has provided. Because you see, the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the moment that you received from God His life and His nature. Now, His life and His nature will never be controlled by those emotions. You will never, you'll, you'll never have a conversation with God and, uh, you know, ask Him, say, well, God, you know, how's it going? And have Him look at you and say, oh, man, I'm telling you, I can't take any more of this. You know, <laughs> it's just all kinds of wars and plagues and pestilence and people blaming me for everything. I just, you know what? I give up. <laughs> I'm tired of being God. You ever seen that movie, Bruce Almighty? Or God lets you know, Jim Carrey be God for a while, and finally Jim Carrey realizes, this is not for me. <laughs> You're God, you be God. Well, see, we cannot justify retaining these emotions. You, now, regardless of how the loss to deal with things, for us as Christians, that which is in us, the life of God, gives us the ability to conquer all of those emotions, no matter what happens. Sooner or later, you're going to get bad news. I don't know what that will be, but you know, all different kinds of things. Sooner or later, you're going to get bad news. Okay, well, what do you do? How are you going to handle it? Remember when Jesus got the news that his cousin John the Baptist had been murdered? He was beheaded? You know what he did? He got alone to pray. He got alone to pray. And if you read the story... In Scripture, what you'll find is that a lot of people came looking for him. And when they found out where he was, they wanted ministry. And he interrupted his prayer time after hearing that his cousin, another miracle baby, John, John the Baptist, had been murdered. He interrupted his time of fellowship with the Father to go and minister to those people. And the one thing he didn't do was walk out there and say, Hey! You think you got it bad? Do you know what I'm going through right now? Do you have any clue? And you expect me to be able to minister to you? What's wrong with you people? Don't you understand I'm hurting on the inside? No, he didn't do that. But he could have. But he didn't. And see, when we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Nowhere in Scripture does it say you will never be touched by grief. You'll never be touched by hurt. You'll never be touched by any of these emotions. However, you have the ability to rise above it. Well, we went through this list, and this morning um, we got through part of it, and I mentioned you know, uh, one of the emotions, and I gave you a Scripture that reveals how that we have victory over this. I uh, mentioned failure, and then we went to Joshua 1.8. Oppression, we went to Psalm 9.9. We went to discouragement and read Psalm 27.14. We mentioned depression and read Psalm 42, verses 5 and 11. We spoke about being offended and saw Psalm 119, verse 165, and Ephesians 4.32. And you know, it's interesting because 
um, there in Psalm 119, 165, he plainly states, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, if you, if you love my word, nothing will offend you. Absolutely nothing will offend you. Doesn't mean that things won't happen that you don't like. Doesn't mean that for a few moments you might sit back and think, why in the world did you do that, say that, act that way, etc.? But nothing will offend you. And Christians that are carrying offense, they do not love God or His Word the way they say. Now you can, do, you can say, well, now Brother Martin, that's not true. Well, no. No, it is true. Because this is the Word of God. We took a look at stressed. And Isaiah 26, verse 3, tells us that when we make a decision to stay our mind on God, we receive perfect peace. Perfect peace. There's no stress. In the body of Christ, there should never be anything called burnout. Not when it comes to serving the Lord. No such thing as burnout. I, you know, I really do feel for the pastors and evangelists and, and whoever that they go through this thing called burnout. I mean, I do, I feel for them. However, they haven't figured out who they are in Christ. They have not figured out how they can truly trust God. Because when it comes to serving God, there is no such thing as burnout. God is not going to burn you out serving Him. It will not happen. So let's pick up from that point and go forward. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And the next one we're going to be looking at is this feeling of giving up. I just can't take any more. I'm just going to give up. I just quit. I just, you know, I just did. I've had it up to here. I give up. Why should I keep trying? Nothing ever works out. Blah, 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 etc., and etc. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You wait upon the Lord, you're going to have your strength renewed. There is no such thing as giving up. Not when you're serving the Lord. Not when you're living as a Christian. There's no such thing as giving up. That feeling, that emotional onslaught is not of God. It's not birthed in you by the Spirit of God. There is a conquering to the giving up feeling. You know, there have been times when um, I say, you know, people ask me to come and minister. And I sit and I think, what in the world do I have to offer them? I mean, you know, I'm me. You know, I'm no whatever. What? Why are they asking me to come? They ought to be asking somebody else. But... I have to do what God tells me to do. And I can't evaluate myself based upon what I think I am or what I think I'm not. I can't, I can't base what I do or my effectiveness on how I perceive me. I have to base my, my effectiveness and how I can impact people relative to to what I'm doing for God and how I submit to Him and let Him work through me. That's all there is to it. If He says, go, you go. That's just like, I forget who it was, Amos, one of those guys in the Old Testament, Hosea, one of them, where you know, God told him, go speak my word. And he really didn't want to because he was happy being a shepherd. But he said, you know what? God, God sent me to, to give you the word, so... Here's the word. <laughs> Take it or leave it. I'm going back to the sheep. <laughs> I mean, that's not exactly what he said, but that's kind of the impression, you know. He just did what he did. Well, you know what? There's no such thing as giving up. If, look, if anybody would have had a reason to give up, it would have been Jesus. Like, how many people do I have to heal before you will accept what I'm saying? <laughs> How many blind eyes do I have to open? How many dead people do I have to raise? Come on, what's wrong with you people? Well, there's no such thing as giving up. Turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. See, 
even when you're at home, at work, whatever, and you're dealing with stuff, and you think, oh, I, I just can't, I give up, give up. You have to remember, this is another major key I'm getting ready to share with you, seriously. God's been around a whole lot longer than you, and He is God. And He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what you're going to do next week before next week gets here. He, before you get into next week, he already knows what you're going to do next week. Next week, Think about that one. Anyway, he knew you were going to be in your present circumstance. He knows how to strengthen you to get through it. He knows. He's already got the plan. So there is no such thing as giving up. Yeah, but I made a wrong decision. Okay, you made a wrong decision. It puts you in the place where you are right now. But there's no such thing as giving up. Because God knows how to strengthen you to make the right decisions to go from here. Now, in John chapter 14, the next one we're going to talk about is worry. In John 14, verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Worry. Worry. This one right here would be number one for a lot of Christians. Worry. And there are times when people ask me to pray for them, and I can, I mean, it's, you're dealing with worry. Your, your problem is not your circumstance. Your problem is the worry. Worry is a greater threat to you than the diagnosis from the doctor. Listen. I heard a story not too long ago, and I don't remember who shared it. It might have been one of you here. I mean, I really don't remember who shared this story. But a lady was feeling really bad, just, just feeling lousy. Now, these are Christians. Feeling lousy. She goes to the doctor, and the doctor checks her out and runs a few tests and comes back and tells her, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but you have advanced cancer, and it's all through your body, and quite frankly... I don't know if you're going to live another 24 hours. She died the next day. Died the next day. Now, I've heard of people going into the doctor and, well, you've got cancer and you may not make it six months, and sure enough, six months later, they die. This is, maybe I'm crazy in saying this, but I personally think if some people didn't hear what the doctor said, they'd live longer than what the doctor said. Now that just, I mean, you don't have to agree with that, and that's okay. But it is just uncanny how many times a doctor would tell somebody how long they have, and boom, that's it. That's when they die. This lady died the next day. Worry. Worry will put you down. Worry will mess up your life. There is no faith in worry. It's not there. And there are too many people that worry, and I, you know some folks, they're so used to worrying, they don't even realize they're worrying. That's like, you know, <laughs> fellow walks up to his friend and says, you know, Ralph, what's going on? You, man, you don't look good. He says, oh man, I'm just worried. I'm just, why, are you, why are you so worried? Well, because there ain't nothing to worry about. <laughs> nah, that didn't really happen. Oh, yeah. Did that really happen? No. But there are a lot of Christians I, it doesn't matter what goes on. They just worry. I don't like to be around that. You know, all these emotions that, that we're talking about here, Christians that live with this stuff, I don't like to be around them. You know, it's, it's like being around somebody that's got real bad B.O. I mean, you just, you don't want to be around people like that. You love them, but boy, they stink. Well, you know, that, all these emotions, that is a soulish stink. And I don't like to be around it. And anybody who's walking close with the Lord doesn't like to be around it either. Now the next one, turn over to Romans chapter 8. And like I said this morning, there are several verses and passages of Scripture that we could use for every single one of these. But in Romans chapter 8, the next one we're going to identify is fear. In Romans 8.15, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, you could teach a whole long time on that verse. 
But relative to this message, that means the born-again Spirit we received from God does not have in it a pre-program for fear. We're not talking about the holy fear of God, okay? There's no fear. Fear is an emotion that is not compatible with the nature of God. It flat out isn't. It's one thing for somebody to go, boo, and you're startled. That's not what what we're talking about. And there's... You know, I shared the story this morning about how that kid down in Texas went into the bathroom and, you know, was going to do bathroom business and and lifts up the toilet seat and there was a rattlesnake crawling out of the the toilet. Okay, now that could instill a lot of fear in somebody. And I'm going to tell you the truth. (laughs) Everything else up until, I don't know, but now I'm going to tell you the truth. If that had happened to me and I had lifted the toilet seat and I'd seen a rattlesnake... (laughs) I would have been startled in a most enthusiastic manner. (laughs) However, I honestly don't know that I would have fear. Now you may think, well, now you say that, but if it... (laughs) And I understand. Really, I do. And I could be wrong. And I don't want to find out. (laughs) But, see, when you're faced with a life and death situation, and you have conquered fear, you will be able to evaluate that situation with the mind of Christ. And that includes a rattlesnake in your toilet. Seriously. It includes face, remember Jesus in the boat? That storm was so bad, seasoned fishermen thought they were going to die. These are guys that have been through a lot of storms. They thought they were going to die. Jesus stood up, no fear. And he said, peace be still. Then he looks at them and says, oh ye of little faith, where's your faith? What's your problem? Have you forgotten about the loaves and fishes? And I'm sure they're thinking, loaves and fishes? Who cares about loaves and fishes? <laughs> There's a storm. Or there was. <laughs> you understand what I mean? See, we can get to that point to where that which truly looks like death, we do not have a fear. Let me put it like this. Do you remember the Apostle Paul? Read all that stuff that he went through. And not one time did he say, boy, I was scared to death. No. He conquered all of it. Well, he didn't like it, but he conquered all of it. And yet, there came a time when he wrote and said, I've run my race, i finished my course, my time is at hand. He knew he was going to die. Read what he wrote to Timothy. He knew he was going to die, but there were... There was no fear in his words. Only encouragement. See, God has not given us a nature that is compatible with fear. Now, holy respect, that's a different thing. You know, I'm not going to be stupid and jump into a pool full of alligators. (laughs) You know, there needs to be wisdom here. We understand that. But fear is something totally different. And there are a lot of people, man, they have fear about almost anything that goes on. Christians, that is not of God, and it's not healthy. The next one, turn over to Romans 15. Romans 15. The next one, hopeless. That feeling of hopeless or hopelessness. Romans 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. There's always hope with God. Always. There there is no such thing as a hopeless situation as a believer. None. Absolutely. Now, granted, for lost people, there is a hopeless situation. As in, you may hope you're going to heaven, but you have no hope unless you're born again. 
But for us as believers, there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. Jesus looks at the masses, and he turns to his apostles, and he says, you feed them. And they say, well, <laughs> with what? And he, Jesus says, well, what do you have? Well, you've know, got a few fish and a few loaves. He goes, okay, we'll bring them here. And they brought them to Jesus, and you know what he did? He blessed them. Je you know, we talk about Jesus fed the thousands. Well, technically not. He blessed the loaves and fishes, and then he gave to the apostles, and the apostles are the ones who fed the thousands. Read the scriptures. Jesus blessed, and they ministered out of what he blessed. Boy, that's a sermon right there. <laughs> There's no such thing as a hopeless situation with God. My job is hopeless. No, it's not. Your job is not hopeless. You, you may get a different job, but your employment situation is not hopeless. It's not hopeless because you are a child of the God of hope. It's, there's nothing hopeless in your life as a believer. The emotions may say otherwise. The circumstances may say otherwise. But He is the God of hope. And He says right here in this verse that He will fill you with hope. Fill you with hope. That means you can look at a situation and everybody else thinks, well, that's it. It's over. It's done for. There's no hope. And yet, on the inside, you know there's hope. And it's out of that hope you can begin to encourage other people or at least try to. But there is no such thing as hopeless in the kingdom of God. The next one. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. <clears throat> and this next one that we're going to talk about is confusion. Confusion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now specifically here, he's talking about you know confusing situations within church services. You know, uh, just mayhem, just you know, no order, no structure. But he's not the author of confusion. Well, if he's not the author of confusion, that applies to a church service and my life. He's not the author of confusion. And I'll read this verse to you as well. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. God's not the author of confusion, and our born-again spirit cannot be confused. You understand what I mean by that? Our born-again spirit, we have been given the mind of Christ. That is a sound mind. It is, listen, it is impossible for a Christian to live with confusion when they know what God has said in here. It's impossible. Now, we don't know all the answers, but God gives us answers. He gives, I just don't know what to do. I just, I'm so confused. Why? You just haven't received the answer yet. <laughs> We're all like that. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, for crying out loud, who does until God gives you the answer? Nobody knows what to do until God lets you know what to do. But, confusion Confusion will lead to all kinds of crazy decisions. And I'm telling you what, when you let confusion, that e when you let that emotion dominate your life and control your way of thinking, you are going to make all kinds of wrong decisions, wrong choices. You're going to make so many mistakes. But you have the mind of Christ. And right now you may not know what to do. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. You continue to seek God and He will continue to give you answers. And He'll give you the answers you need, and He'll give them to you when you need them. But confusion will cloud your judgment, and it will also cloud your understanding of what God is saying to you. Confusion is an imagination which must be cast down. There is no such thing as confusion in the mind of Christ. The next one. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. The next one is 
those feelings of being defeated. And a lot of Christians feel like they've lost. Well, you haven't lost. Because 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you may feel like you've lost, but you haven't lost. You go into extra innings. (laughs) You go into overtime. You keep playing until you win. Because God's already given you the victory. You might not know the final score, but you know you're going to have more points than the other team because God's given you the victory. He's given you the victory in every situation. I'm firmly convinced that a lot of believers go through stuff in life, and let's include sickness and so forth, that they don't have to, but they really don't understand this concept of victory, and they really don't understand the essence of what I'm sharing with you today. Now, I'm not standing here and trying to present myself as being the perfect example of someone who has conquered all of these emotions all the time. Now, I'm further along than what I used to be, but I'm still learning, and I'm still conquering. And there are times when, when I yield to emotions, you know, one of these emotions in here, I yield over, but then I go back to God and I talk about this. And I don't know, I mean... The way I look at it, if I were him, I'd kind of get tired of me keep coming back and say, I'm sorry, I did it again. (laughs) But he says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Well, if he doesn't want me hanging around, then he he shouldn't have said that. (laughs) I'm going to keep going back and I'm going to keep apologizing. I'm going to keep repenting. I'm going to keep keep making progress. I am. Because I've been given the victory over these things. And I'm going to live in it. I'm not defeated. Emotions will not defeat me. Oh, it may seem like it and feel like it at times, but they're not. I I am more than a conqueror. Praise God. Now look over in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This next one we're going to uh, cover is rejection. Rejection. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He, God, hath made us accepted in the Beloved. We're accepted. Everybody else may think you're stupid, and ugly, and smelly, and everything else they can think of. You know, stink, stank, stunk. That's you. (laughs) But God says, hey, wait a second. I say you're accepted. Now wait, now look at this. Look, Look here, look. Are you looking? (laughs) He says that God has made us accepted in the Beloved. All right, another way to say that, accepted in the body of Christ. You see that? This This is not just accepted in His presence. Accepted in the body of Christ. Do you realize that from God's perspective, we are accepted among believers. That's how he sees it. Now you can make yourself offensive. You understand what I mean by that? I mean, if you want to be a jerk, you can be a jerk. And a lot of people, they're not going to want to hang around you. And if you go and complain to God about it, he'll just say, hey, if I was down there, I wouldn't hang around you either because <laughs> the way you act. <laughs> Now, you guys understand what I'm talking about. A lot of this whole thing of of rejection, these are feelings that are self-imposed. Nobody wants to be around me. Nobody likes me. Nobody. All my life I've been rejected. All my oh, get over it. That may be true. But I'll I know for a fact that you had at least one person somewhere along the line who liked you. I mean, nobody's been rejected by every human being that walks on planet Earth. Maybe, maybe you were a nerd, but there was another nerd who accepted you. <laughs> but these things, have, you may not want me around, but God does. 
I am accepted. God accepts me. You may not like the clothes I wear. You may think that I'm this and I'm that. But you know what? Hey, you can think whatever. God accepts me. And He outranks you. (laughs) I am accepted. I'm accepted. I am accepted. The next one. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This next one is anxiety. Anxiety. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful. That word careful comes from a Greek word that means anxious or filled with anxiety, troubled, etc. So be anxious or be filled with anxiety about nothing. But in everything you face, no matter what it is, no matter how impossible the situation, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Your heart and mind, your heart and mind, your heart and mind. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Do not. Let yourself be overcome by anxiety. That's what he's saying, no matter what the situation. Be anxietied about nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know, these things that I'm reading to you, these passages of Scripture, some of these in the natural would seem absolutely impossible to some Christians. But you don't know, but you don't know. Hold on now. This is God saying. God is the one who has said, do not allow anxiety to overwhelm you, no matter what your situation. But in everything, stay focused on Him. Praise Him. Thank Him. Glorify Him. Turn it over to Him in prayer. And the peace that passes all understanding will act like an armed soldier and guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. There's no such thing as anxiety for a believer, there is anxiety does not exist in the character and the nature of the born again spirit. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and this is the last one in this list. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and again, this is one. I mean, there are so many verses we could look at, but what is the emotion we're identifying? The feelings of being unloved. In verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You're loved. I mean, there's so many that we could use for this one. Probably more verses to use for this one than any other. You're loved. God is love. I mean, Just over and over we see God's expression of love to us in Scripture. You're loved. You are loved. You are loved. You hear me? You're loved. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you face. I don't care who looks at you and says, I hate you. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. God loves you. And that is all that matters. Because people can choose not to love you. Even Christians. Christians can say, well, I, I, you know, they, they can turn on you. But God can't. Because He is love. God loves you. And if you have to live in this life with not one single human being loving you, you know what? You can still feel more loved than any other human being on this planet. Because of God's love. The love of God supersedes any love that can come out of another individual. Even God's love coming through an individual. And the reason for that is because God is the pinnacle of absolute love. We are maturing in that love. We are not yet at that absolute pinnacle, but He is. Therefore, if I pursue experiencing His love, I will feel loved no matter what. I will feel loved no matter what. Yeah, but my kids rejected me. God hasn't. But my husband, my wife rejected me. God hasn't, and He won't. Yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, yeah, but all night long. God still loves you. 
Turn over to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And we're going to read in Psalm 118 a verse that paints an image concerning all of this. <clears throat> Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. See this? When you allow the words and actions of others to control your emotional state, you are not fully trusting God. All of these emotions that I've shared with you, these negative emotions, every single one of them that a believer would hold on to, it's a result of interaction with people. Some way, somehow, directly or indirectly. There are Christians who have gone ballistic over the election. That is interaction with others, directly or indirectly. I mean, on and on it goes. Some, you know, what was that Neil Diamond song? This is another somebody did somebody wrong song. You know? <laughs> there are Christians that live like that. And he says right here, look, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. If I put my confidence in you, to assure my emotional stability, I am setting myself up for failure. I am setting myself up for a collapse and disappointment and, and all of these emotions and more to begin to overwhelm me. Because I'm telling you what, people can let you down. Every person can let you down, and most of them probably will. Not everybody, but most will probably let you down. I want to put my confidence in God because, see, when I put my confidence in God, no matter what you do, no matter how you act, I know this, I am not going to be governed by my emotions. You know, as a pastor of a church, <laughs> you have people that, oh, I'll do this and I'll do that, and, and you know, oh yeah, I'll do that. And, I'll, and all these you know, people give their word, they're going to follow through, they're going to, and they don't. And they don't. And you can sit back and think, man, oh man, I mean, when are people going to do what they say? It's not just a matter of somebody doing what they say, but doing the way they're supposed to do it. And I'm not going to stand here and go on some kind of a rant, but what I'm saying is, people cannot be trusted the way God can be trusted. And when you put your confidence in God, fully in God, there are, there are times you're not going to like what people do. And that's understandable. That's life in this life. There are times there will be situations that just are really disappointing. You notice disappointment is not in that list. Because disappointment does not... Disappointment can lead to those emotions. You understand what I mean by that? So you're going to be disappointed. I stand here tonight. I'm disappointed in a lot of people. You know, Is it me, Brother Martin? Is it? <laughs> I'm not saying yay, nay, or mm. I just, well, We're going to leave it alone. But I'm disappointed in a lot of people. But see, that disappointment does not lead me to being controlled by these emotions. I'm going to put my trust and my confidence in God. Now, I'll tell you, you have to learn to do that, though. But when you put your confidence in God above confidence in man, you're not going to let man control your emotions. You're not going to let the actions of people lead you to the place of being controlled by these emotions. And there are some Christians, by the time this message is over, there are some Christians who will have heard both parts of this sermon, this is something you need to deal with. You need to work on this. Listen, nobody is immune from an attack of all of these emotions that I have identified here. Nobody's immune from being attacked by them. But they don't have to win. But they will be attacked. There will be attacks. Nobody's immune from it. We're all going to be faced with them. Even so, victory over them all is alive in the heart of every Christian. 
It's in there. It's in there. Yeah, there are going to be times of loss. Look, (laughs) you live long enough and you are going to outlive your grandparents, your parents, your children, even your grandchildren, if you live long enough. That's not a very pleasant thought. (laughs) I know it. (coughs) But guys, that's how it is in this world. That's how it is. The day is coming, all that's going to change. But for right now, that's how it is. People that have thought their jobs were stable, (laughs) all of a sudden, we're sorry, but we're letting you go. Look, stuff's going to happen. You know, you sooner or later, you're going to have to buy new tires for your car. Do you understand what I mean? S- stuff just happens in this world. It's all because of Genesis 3. It's all because of Adam. Just If you want to take it out on somebody, wait till you see him, okay? <laughs> but by the time you see him... It's going to be, I forgive you, Adam. (laughs) None of these emotions have to control us. We have the power to control them. They will impact us. We will be touched, you know, like Jesus, with the feelings of infirmities, but we don't have to give in. We can fight them. We can beat them. We can rise above them and live beyond their control. Yeah, it's a battle. But we've been made more than conquerors. Praise God. Please stand. Father, I thank You for Your Word. Your Word is true. When it comes to battling emotions like this, all that that I've identified here in this message this morning and tonight, and emotions that weren't identified, Father, all these emotions that are negative, that are not associated with who we become in Christ, We do not have to be their temple. We do not have to allow them to live in our lives. We are not exempt from their attack, but we can rise over them and defeat them every time. Father, there's a term that a lot of people like to use. It's called self-control. Well, I think there's a better term, Father. Christ-controlled. And if we control ourselves with Christ in us, the hope of glory, control ourselves by that new nature on the inside, it's a whole different story. So I thank You for this. And I thank You, Father, that there's no excuse. Because if there were an excuse, if there were a justification to hold on to these things, it would mean that we have not been made complete in Christ. But we are complete in Him. Thank You for this. Thank You for it, Father. And I just ask You to help me with this and everybody else who's heard this message. Bless Your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank You, Lord. I love You. I love You. I love You. Praise God. God's thought of everything. (laughs) Everything. I mean, anybody who knows the beginning from the end, he's going to have a plan. He's going to have a plan. I don't know how many people this would apply to. But the Lord... Okay, stop living by the self-image you've created for yourself and start living by the image that I have of you in my heart. Cast down the imaginations of your self-image and receive from me the reality of my image of you. You are living beneath your potential because you're living by a self-image. 
Let me show you what I know of you. And I will be able to raise you higher. Thank you, Jesus. That word, that's going to impact some people when it comes to employment. I've talked to people before about jobs. And out of their self-image, what I hear so many times is, but I can't, but I can't, but I can't. No? Okay. Okay. Do you know that Einstein's had a teacher, I think it was like third grade. Might have been fourth. Anyway, you know who Einstein is, right? Real smart guy. Good at math. <laughs> he had a teacher that told his parents to take him out of school because he's too dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that teacher was wrong. <laughs> Here's what's interesting. Einstein didn't appear to allow that teacher to infuse into him the self-image of dumb. Think about that. Well, praise God, we're going to go ahead and dismiss. I hear your stomachs. Yes, I do. Pizza, pizza. So, uh, if you don't know how to get to Marion's from here, you can follow somebody who does know how to get to Marion's from here. Most of you probably know how by now. So uh, before we leave, though, if you have an offering, please go ahead and bring it up. And those of you watching, you can send your offering in as well. If you have anything you'd like me to pray with you about, I will do that. But other than that, we'll see you at Marion's. Hallelujah.